morning, everyone. Um, I want to introduce to you um, Dr. Diego San Milan. Uh, it's an honor to have him today. Uh, he has a lot of experience, uh, graduated uh, from the University of Milan in 1998, um, did uh, training as a fellowship uh, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, USA. And um, he's currently in Switzerland now, uh, a very experienced uh, interventional neuroradiologist with a very uh, interesting topic here. Uh, on imaging and percutaneous treatment of dorsal and lumbar osteoporotic lesions. Um, Dr. San, uh, Diego Samblan, I'm going to turn it over to you. If you guys have questions, go ahead and uh, type them in. And um, from time to time, I'll you know, interrupt Dr. Samblan and go ahead and uh, share your questions with him, OK? All right, Dr. Samblan, I'll uh, turn okay. it over to you now. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, for this invitation. It's a, a pleasure uh, to, to give this talk. Um, I, I don't think I've given a talk to so many people in, at the same moment in different parts of the world. So um, pl please interrupt me. Something is not clear if you have any questions. If I speak too fast, uh, please let me know and um, uh, we can adapt. So <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing with you um, uh, this topic, as you can see. Um, it, it's something that I've been uh, involved uh, in uh, for, for quite some time now. Um, since I do interventional spine uh, procedures and diagnostic, I'm actually a diagnostic and interventional neuroradiologist. I trained uh, um, in Geneva for radiology, diagnostic neuroradiology, and then I moved on to the States to do the interventional part. And uh, now for 11 years, I'm, I live in Sion, uh, probably never heard of it. It's a very small town in the Swiss Alps, but we have a, a very nice activity and a very good collaboration uh, with uh, neurology, with uh, neurosurgeons, um, and also a rehab center that is uh, next door. So this has, allows us to, uh, to have an interesting activity and to, to see a very varied activity. So this time I will talk to you about osteoporotic uh, spine lesions. In two weeks' time, I will be discussing more oncological aspects. Um, so um, I hope uh, we'll be together in two weeks. Um, so I have no disclosures. I would like to uh, just acknowledge, uh, uh, this is Dr. Abderrahman Hejouj, he's my fellow in your radiology, a uh, very bright person uh, who does a lot of ENT and many, many other things. And this is uh, Dr. Alexander Ciamponi, who's the chief of neuroradiology in Lugano, in the Italian part of Switzerland. And I'm very thankful to him. Uh, he's one of the persons I ask for advice when I have doubts, because I work uh, pretty much alone here as an interventionist. And uh, he's actually kind, been kind enough to come and train me for uh, his technique, which we will discuss later, which is called SAFE. Um, so the, the, the general plan is that we will just some a bit of background on osteoporosis, the definition, the prevalence, the clinical consequences. It's something that uh, treating a lot of these patients, you come to realize that this is a, a big uh, big issue, a big problem for, I think, uh, most uh, society. And uh, with the aging population, it's becoming something uh, that, that uh, will, will take a lot of our time and efforts. Uh, we'll discuss um, some of the imaging osteoporotic um, imaging uh, techniques that we can uh, uh, to, to use to explore, uh, especially these compression uh, fractures, and also the consequences of uh, these uh, fractures. And then uh, we'll discuss uh, some percutaneous treatment uh, options uh, that are available to us um, at the moment. And uh, the, really, the talks like this are the aim is to, to sensitize uh, all physicians uh, to this big problem of osteoporosis. And uh, as radiologists, we have a role in detecting, describing, and classifying these lesions. Uh, we might be the first ones to suspect an osteoporosis on a um, on, uh, on a patient uh, doing a chest x-ray, we find three, four uh, vertical fractures. And this is very important to, to, um, um, to um, inform uh, the, um, the physicians taking care of this patient so that they can initiate treatment. So as radiologists, whether we are general radiologists, neuro, MSK, uh, we deal with this and uh, we are part of the management. And then uh, also to, to try to explain this I think there's a paradigm shift concerning percutaneous treatments in um, osteoporosis uh, fractures, uh, going from uh, just pain relief uh, to other um, uh, implications as we're going to see. 
So the definition of osteoporosis, uh, it's a systemic disease characterized by weakened and fragile bone. Uh, and this can lead to increased risk of fracture. And um, it's a chronic disease. You don't really cure from it, uh, but you can treat it with anabolic or anti-resorbative drugs, but also uh, uh, with uh, eating habits, uh, uh, daily activities, sports, uh, to, uh, and then obviously reducing the risk factors. And um, so the medical treatment increases the bone density and reduces the risk uh, of new fractures, um, uh, but not completely. And uh, the most frequent fracture sites are the hip and the vertebra. Uh, that's where we, we get involved. Um, so it's widely underdiagnosed and widely undertreated. And these are some not, not so recent uh, Swiss statistics, but I think it's pretty much the same everywhere else. Um, so in Switzerland, which is a you know, uh, rich country with a good medical system, 10% um, of patients with osteoporosis receive treatment. And less than 20% of the patients who have an osteoporosis-related fracture, be it a hip fracture or a vertebral fracture, will receive this treatment. So there's a huge under-treatment and under-diagnosis of this. And I see this all the time. I treat patients that come with a fracture. And uh, in our reports, we always report this is an osteoporotic fracture, needs to uh, an osteoporotic uh, workup and treatment. And then they come back uh, two months later with a new fracture and no, no treatment has been initiated. <clears throat> so the, the incidence, uh, as you can see, it's very frequent. 26% of women over uh, 50 years and then 40% of the women over 80 years. And uh, the risk, and you can see it's not just uh, women who are affected, but uh, also uh, men. And um, after 50 to 79 years, it's 1% per year for, for women and a bit less so for, for, for men. But then it increases significantly after 80 years old. So um, it's a very uh, prevalent disease. Now, as we were saying, uh, these are uh, some slides. Last, last week, there was the uh, American Spine Society radiology meeting um, and uh, this is a slide from Dr. Singer, and uh, she's comparing uh, uh, treatment initiation for osteoporosis, for example, uh, compared to beta blockers after a heart attack, where it's pretty much 91%, and for um, osteoporotic fractures, it's 40% uh, in the United States. So it's very low. And um, so one of the problems, one of the issues why people do not think of it is that they can uh, be insidious. They, Trauma is not necessary, so people, uh, mostly uh, older ladies, only start having pain in their back, and uh, they get uh, conservative treatment. And finally, uh, somebody does an X-ray or an MR or a CT, and then they they fall in this osteoporosis. But um, actually, um, so they, they they occur spontaneously without a fall. Some patients wake up with the pain, so they fracture during the night. Um, and it's sometimes a very insidious in, um, onset. So it can take two, three, four days to, uh, to appear the, the, the final uh, very strong pain. Um, now, that there's, once you have this fracture, uh, you increase the risk of uh, fracturing other uh, vertebra. And uh, actually, you have, you're in a situation where you have extreme bone fragility for a time. So uh, in the right setting, a vertebral fracture signs osteoporosis, and it's enough without having to do osteodensitometry to do a workup for osteoporosis and to treat it. <clears throat> now, this is just to, to, to show a little bit the impact, the, the, the huge public health issue that it represents. If you look at the hospital days um, um, for osteoporosis, it's higher than myocardial infarction, stroke, uh, breast uh, tumors. So it's, uh, it's a huge burden on the on the health uh, uh, system, and it costs also a lot. So what, what are the treatment options um, once you have a, a, a fracture? Uh, so traditionally, it's conservative, conservative treatment with bed rest and uh, bracing, which, is, uh, which can uh, work, but it doesn't uh, stop the fracture from really progressing, and it doesn't really work for the dorsal region. So it's uh, debated. Um, pain medications, including opioids, uh, that are often necessary to take care of this pain. And then we have the percutaneous treatments, uh, which are called vertebral augmentations in the literature. Uh, 
I don't think it's the best term because uh, the, not all augment the vertebra. For example, vertebroplasty just fill, fills the vertebral body, but uh, that's uh, pretty much a term that is used everywhere. And you can do just vertebroplasty, which is injecting cement in the vertebra, or doing a kyphoplasty. So prior to injecting the cement, you inflate a balloon uh, to, to create uh, some space to maybe, with a bit of luck, increase the height of the vertebra. And then recently, and this has really changed our practice, um, uh, we have implantable devices that will stay in the vertebra, uh, which are actually prothesis. And uh, what we use the most is uh, stents. And then you do a vertebroplasty, you put cement in. And then recently, uh, thanks to Dr. Camponi, uh, we have this sort of um, uh, new treatment that, that I will do, explain at the end. So stent screw assisted internal fixation. <clears throat> So what's the natural history of, of the pain of these fractures? Well, uh, there's a, a large percentage of these fractures which are asymptomatic. And it's always surprising when you fall on an x-ray when you have six, seven, eight fractures, you have also kyphosis and, and the patient says, no, I never really had back pain. So they can be completely asymptomatic. And um, th there are very few studies actually that uh, describe the real natural history of these uh, fractures. Mostly were uh, studies trying to demonstrate the, the benefit of uh, um, uh, percutaneous treatments over controls. So these control groups were studied. And basically the, the conclusion is um, that uh, normally uh, osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures, they will uh, take some time to heal uh, in the older patients uh, particularly. And uh, you will get a gradual improvement of the pain in two to 12 weeks, which is a long time. And there's no, no, there are no predictive factors to know which patients are going to develop a long-lasting uh, pain uh, as opposed to those that will have no pain after two, three weeks, uh, at least on the initial um, workup. Obviously, if you have clefts uh, that, uh, on, on the imaging, uh, you can predict that probably it's going to last longer. Hi, Dr. San Milan, I have uh, one question here for you. Um, how frequent do you see patients with osteoporosis secondary to hormone therapy, for example, tamoxifen? Tamoxifen for estrogen and progesterone receptor positive breast cancer. I, I would say that's pretty rare. Um, I guess I treat many more, unfortunately, many more uh, um, metastasis from breast cancer than uh, medically induced osteoporosis. Obviously, all these chronically pa chronic old patients, um, plus with the hormone anti hormone therapy, they, 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 they are at higher risk. But it's not the major population, I would say, no. Not very frequent. Um, so if we look at the Swiss Medical Board, uh, recommends uh, guidelines, gives guidelines in Switzerland. Uh, this is what they say. They haven't updated it since 2011, which is a long time. Um, so vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty are efficient for a subgroup of patients without significant pain or functional improvement despite several weeks of conservative treatment. Now that's very broad because uh, we don't really know exactly what that subgroup of patients will be, um, what, what is significant pain and functional improvement, what are the criteria to decide that. Um, and then several weeks is also, uh, is it three weeks, five weeks, 10 weeks? So it's very vague. And uh, at least they, they don't say that we shouldn't be doing it, but they don't really recommend it one way or the other. Um, now, the, the problem with this conservative treatment is that it's not necessarily safe, uh, especially if we have older people, uh, low mobility people, people that have other comorbidities. Um, so th this conservative treatment, uh, it's basically uh, bed rest, not doing much, uh, even staying in bed for, for, for long periods of time. And especially in this population, uh, we have a very uh, important loss of muscle strength the moment you're not um, uh, ambulant anymore. Uh, which can go up to 50% of your muscle strength in three to five weeks. So this is very, very quick. And then uh, other problems like pressure sores and ulcers, uh, because you're immobilized, there's a higher risk of uh, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, constipation, fecal infections, uh, pulmonary and also urinary tract infections, and then complications related to the, to the treatment, uh, the pain medication. Uh, renal insufficiency because of uh, anti-inflammatory drugs uh, and mostly the opioid complications and elderly people are particularly uh, susceptible to 
uh, confusional states. And uh, so it's, it's, um, this brings a lot of uh, morbidity. And then there's a loss of independence. It's a big burden for families. Uh, patients uh, uh, can sometimes spend weeks at the hospital, they get institutionalized, and this is a, um, a very dramatic at uh, any age, but especially that age. And uh, so it costs a lot as well. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the slides uh, courtesy of Dr. Uh, Josh Hirsch. Um, what are the consequences? Uh, so pretty much is what, what I was um, implying. Uh, I've added depression. This is a really underdiagnosed uh, condition in these uh, old people. And when you talk to them, uh, they, they've lost uh, all their drive and uh, they, because they cannot do anything anymore. Where I live, uh, it's in the mountains. We have a lot of uh, very active old people who suddenly become uh, completely dependent on their, on their family. And that's uh, very difficult for them. So impaired gait, so full balance for falls, uh, the disability reduced to the, uh, that leads to reduced quality of life. As we mentioned, the lung respiratory problems, early society gastric distress. This is um, all these complications also reflect the uh, uh, kyphosis deformations that we're going to discuss in, in a minute. And then the future fracture risk that we've mentioned, especially if you have kyphosis and if you fall, then you have a very high risk of uh, developing other fractures. And this is a very important notion, and we know this now for quite a while. Uh, the, the mortality rate in, for osteoporotic fractures, and uh, we're going to discuss this as well uh, over here. So this is, a, uh, as Dr. Hirsch says, this is a bad disease. And look at the statistics, they're pretty frightening. And uh, you have, okay, uh, I'll be, uh, these are older patients who don't have a very, for some of them, uh, you know, if you're 80, obviously, uh, you won't have 20 years ahead of you necessarily, but it's uh, at five years, you have 40% um, mortality rates, and that's uh, very important. And this is related to the complications from uh, osteoporotic uh, vertebral compression uh, fracture. <clears throat> so wh why this mortality? And uh, this is um, uh, this downward spiral. So first you have the back pain, then uh, you might get the spinal deformity with the kyphosis, which will decrease your lung capacity uh, because you have reduced height and um, uh, you're completely kyphotic. Uh, so you have an Im impaired uh, function, a less resistant, loss of appetite, sleeping problems, decreased activity, and then you go to this uh, uh, spiral with uh, an increased risk of, of fracture and all the other complications that come with it. And at the end, we have an increased mortality. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's something that we see and it's, um, uh, I, I think, completely under-recognized. So the kyphosis, um, so when I started doing these procedures, I was putting in cement for pain relief and I didn't really have a notion of what the consequences were from, for example, this kyphosis. And actually when we, when we get patients that are down the line, they, they, they've had a fracture for four or five months and they've, they have a 20% increase of their kyphosis and uh, they come with symptoms that are really very difficult to, to treat and that cause a lot of uh, investigation. For example, abdominal symptoms, which is early society, epigastric pain, very often reported, lower abdominal vague pain, discomfort, bloating, and uh, so they get um, endoscopies and uh, all sorts of treatments, but actually the cause is, is the kyphosis. The thoracic syndrome, the reduction of the vital capacity, is a restrictive uh, lung disease, pain due to facet or sacroiliac syndromes, secondary to the a misalignment of the spine, conflict between the lower ribs and the iliac crest. These patients, when they're sitting down, the, the, the ribs are overlapping the iliac crest, and this causes pain, and it's very, very difficult to treat uh, if ever we manage to treat those. And then there are increased risk of falls due to the uh, anti portion of the body, and uh, uh, the increased risk of adjacent and remote vertebral fractures, which are going to um, induce this spiral we've mentioned before. <clears throat> so what, what does kyphosis do? Well, what it does is that it, it increases, so we have the, 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 the center of gravity, which is going to be pulled forward, advanced, and this uh, increases the lever arm. Uh, so whenever you have a pressure load that is applied distantly, uh, the effect on the, on, the, on the vertebra is huge. So uh, for example, normally a normal vertebra can take up to 500 kilograms of compression force, and here, 
20 kilograms applied here will actually uh, cause a fracture of a mastoporotic uh, uh, vertebra. So um, this kyphosis is uh, very important. And um, this is just to illustrate. So these patients, uh, 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 you, you see them when they come into your office and, and then you do these x-rays and you can imagine that your sagittal uh, balance is completely uh, off. So we have to think beyond pain palliation when we're dealing with these patients. Uh, we need to think of high perspiration. Uh, even if we don't have kyphosis, if we lose uh, four centimeters or five centimeters of the thoracic spine, um, that's going to reduce our vital capacity. We need to correct this kyphosis if we can. Um, uh, there's also scoliotic deformities that are going to be secondary to the fractures. So we, we need to recover this actual load capability and we need to prevent uh, collapse of uh, existing fractures of vertebras that are already fractured in order to reduce the risk of the deformity and also neurological complications, which are generally rare, <coughs> but uh, compressive radicular syndromes from uh, uh, foraminal um, or um, uh, recessal uh, compromise are very difficult to treat in these patients. So morphological and functional restoration of the spine and, um, uh, is, is important to reduce the mor morbidity and mortality in these patients. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of these classifications. I won't really go into detail, but uh, basically also product fractures, most of them are uh, A compression fractures, and, um, but they can be severe. So this, these are burst fractures, incomplete burst, uh, complete burst, but usually they spare the posterior uh, elements. Um, but any of these cause pain, and uh, these are obviously more at risk of causing uh, neurological complications, but these typically cause a lot of kyphosis, uh, different classifications. And um, this three-column spine concept is important. Uh, uh, also for, as you're going to see, uh, for the developing uh, treatment strategies that we have. Um, <clears throat> so we have an anterior column, so it's the anterior uh, half of the vertebral body, the annulus fibrosis, and the anterior longitudinal ligament. The posterior column, uh, which is going to be the uh, posterior elements, uh, uh, bony elements, but also the facet uh, articulations, joints, and then the inter and supraspinous um, uh, ligaments. And, um, and then we have the middle uh, column, which is um, uh, over here representing the posterior third of the, or the posterior half of the vertebral body and uh, the posterior annulus fibrosis and the posterior longitudinal ligament. So depending on where your fracture is, uh, how many columns are uh, involved, then uh, you have instability. Uh, this is the classic basic fracture if you want with a little bit of a wedge shape. Um, and um, this uh, involves only the anterior column, the risk of uh, complications from this other than kyphosis are very, very low. <clears throat> so usually this is a conservative treatment unless uh, pain cannot be controlled or we see that there's increasing deformity on follow-up x-rays, etc. Now, often we get both anterior and middle columns in osteoporosis and this is typically, so, so, so this has been detected too late and often we get this, we have a fracture that comes in, it's just into a column and then uh, one month later we, we find ourselves in this situation and that's more complex to treat. And uh, here we have the uh, anterior and uh, middle columns. You can see here the retropulsion of the posterior wall. We have a fracture of the um, corporeal particular uh, junction. So that here there's instability and there's a high risk of progression in terms of retropulsion of the posterior wall with neurological compromise. <clears throat> So typically these fractures, um, we need to stabilize. Now surgery is, is difficult in these patients. Uh, they're elderly, they have comorbidities, so it's invasive procedure, plus there's a problem with the screw fixations in a, in a osteoporotic bone. So there's really, I think, a shift towards um, minimally invasive uh, treatments. And uh, you will see, uh, thanks to Dr. Tamponi's work, uh, I think we have uh, some really very useful tools. So we need to, do, to have this, idea of an internal vertebral fixation. Um, these are the posterior column fractures, which are obviously are associated with the anterior and middle columns most of the time. 
and uh, what will, these are highly unstable fractures with, with ligamentous uh, injuries and um, um, sometimes uh, epidural um, uh, hematomas and you know, compressions and stuff like that. So these are uh, surgical um, patients, but sometimes we can have a combined in internal stabilization first or during the procedure as, uh, as in this case. <clears throat> so we've extensively discussed this, the pain and mobility, the loss of height and the kyphosis and the mortality risk uh, as consequences. Now, sometimes you have less uh, uh, dramatic consequences, radicular syndromes, irritation of a, of a nerve root due to fracture. Uh, for example, in this patient, he had a, a left um, uh, L4 uh, radicular syndrome without deficit. And, um, and this was due to the instability uh, of, uh, around the pedicle, maybe the root of pulse you know, with the recessal uh, um, compromise here. Uh, but typically these are going to go do very well if we if we stabilize the vertebra and uh, it's it's very rare that uh, after we, we treat one of these uh, unless you have a, a, a neurological deficit but if it's just a irritation from the of the nerve root normally it goes away once you do the mechanical stabilization now <clears throat> when it comes to imaging um, all modalities uh, you know them all very well and i think they're all still useful in 2021, x-rays, CT, and MRI. One of the problems we have with the, well, for, for x-rays is that if we don't have a comparative study, it's not always easy to know if it's an, or it's actually pretty difficult to know if it's an acute um, or an old fracture, and then we cannot say whether it's uh, it's been consolidated or not. CT is a little bit better, but uh, we need MRI because um, we have situations like these where we have uh, clearly the, it seems to be the culprit of the pain is this fracture, but there's actually a, also a fracture of the adjacent vertebra without uh, actually any loss of height. And you will miss this one if you don't do an MRI. And then you might, if you do a percutaneous treatment, you will not uh, be treating uh, the entire, um, the entire uh, uh, problem. So we always do an MRI before. And uh, so we need to evaluate the state of consolidation <clears throat> to detect um, um, fractures that are might, might be missed by CT or X-ray, and uh, we we don't do much in terms of MRI. We typically do these three sequences: the STIR, uh, T1, uh, with uh, also a coronal, and we like to use a large frog a field of view so that we can sometimes uh, well they, they tell us the pain the patient has pain uh, in lumbar region. Uh, but actually he's got an additional fracture upstairs. And also one has to bear in mind that often fractures around the D12, uh, L1, the, uh, the pain actually is felt by the patient uh, levels below. So the pain is not always a good indicative uh, measure for uh, to show where the fractures are. Uh, so with these sequences, we, we can uh, pretty much uh, rule out um, uh, all the, and, uh, a non-detected fracture on CT. So <clears throat> we can discriminate consolidated versus non-consolidated and I insist on this because I think these terms of acute, recent, old, you can have a one-year-old fracture that has not consolidated and, you, and is causing pain. Um, and uh, so it's old, but it's still not healed. Uh, and inversely, you can have a fracture that is three weeks old and it's not causing pain anymore. Uh, and it's actually nearly consolidated. So I. I think the, this is a, a better measure of whether um, this really helps us to, to decide whether we treat a patient or not. And also to rule out eventually underlying neoplasia. If you have clefts like this, most of I mean, the large, vast majority of cases is osteoporotic. I think, and also we have a few cases of tumors where you have a cleft, but the, the setting is usually uh, very clear. Um, but does the MRI rule out neoplasia? Well, uh, uh, not always, which is why we always do a biopsy when we do these ver uh, vertebral uh, procedures. And for example, in this patient, uh, where her um, the T1 uh, signal of the uh, um, of the bone marrow is completely normal. If she 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 the, the biopsy demonstrated a, a multiple myeloma, and we have one or two of these uh, every year. Uh, that's why I always do this, and this is supported by the literature. <coughs> so. CT is helpful to, to see um, whether you have signs of sclerosis already, 
which need to be distinguished um, from compression of the uh, of bone. And um, this usually tells us that the fracture is uh, several weeks old, but doesn't mean it's healed. As you can see here, uh, we have on the MR with the stirring mute, we still have edema and this patient uh, was actually painful. Uh, she had pain. And, um, and this is actually a case we, we need to treat. And I haven't put the images, otherwise there will be too many uh, cases, but uh, this we managed actually to lift by putting stents and actually with a curette going through the bone, uh, making a cavity, and then uh, we managed to correct her, her kyphosis. So it's not necessarily a contraindication um, in an osteoporotic setting to have sclerosis. You may be able to lift the vertebrae. Um, <clears throat> so clefts, that, so the, the imaging is necessary for that as well. Uh, to see whether we, we have this uh, osteonecrosis, uh, which normally takes a while to set in, but actually uh, very often uh, we see them very, very early. And I wonder sometimes if the necrosis doesn't precede the fracture. Um, and uh, so this is the appearance on MR. You can have the air uh, up there. And um, uh, this shows how important it is to do x-rays on these patients if they manage to be upright, because you have a completely different image. Look at this vertebra plana here, the impingement between the different vertebra. Uh, so you, you might have different planning if you see um, the impact uh, on the upright position on the, on the um, uh, spine deformity. And this, just for the anecdote, because this is very rare, we managed actually to fill uh, this vertebra pretty much by injecting uh, the one below, uh, there was a connection between uh, the two, and uh, actually um, uh, it worked well. This is uh, several years down the line, and uh, there was maybe a little bit of a retropulsion of the posterior wall, but not too much. So this, I think we were pretty lucky. Now we wouldn't treat like this, uh, this vertebra, but at the time we didn't have any other means. Um, so sometimes you cannot do MRI because uh, you need um, uh, patients have French indications, for example, so you can inspect CT, which will show you uh, in cases like this, which is uh, the vertebra that has not consolidated. Uh, sometimes if it's a very necrotic, there's a big necrotic cavity, it doesn't uh, do, take uh, the, the tracer, uh, but uh, with the necrosis, you know it's not a heel fracture, so that's not really a problem. Um, and um, now with dual energy CT, uh, we can uh, do uh, analysis of the bone marrow edema. Um, using the spectral uh, imaging. So we have the, the water contents and in this, uh, in this fracture, we can suspect actually that this is a non-healed, non-consolidated fracture. We have edema here, which is confirmed on MRI. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, there are some papers already there in the li literature, um, and, but I think it's quite promising and um, um, it can be useful for patients that kind of go into the MR in acute setting trauma. Um, uh, acute trauma setting. Uh, if it has high sensitivity and specificity, we can uh, maybe unburden the MRI, uh, but we need uh, to have uh, further validation. <clears throat> so what are the possibilities for procutaneous treatment? So we've already seen some cases of vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty. Then we have these implantable devices, typically vertebral bone stents, I will show you. Uh, some cases and um, spine jack is uh, it's like a miniature car jack. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea for osteoporosis because the, the, the surface, uh, the contact surface is very small and uh, you, you, it doesn't um, hold the bone enough even if you put cement and uh, you end up uh, very often with the, with the, um, the device in the discs and, uh, and then um, uh, you can have problems with that. So, sorry, well, the safe technique I will show you at the end. So what is the evidence for pain relief? And all the studies till now have really focused on that because vertebroplasty was invented as a pain relief um, procedure. And uh, <clears throat> so pretty much until now, we have 14 randomized control studies uh, for osteo, um, osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures. And the methodologies are very different very strange methodology sometimes, for example, comparing uh, vertebroplasty um, uh, with uh, sham procedures. So you, you actually do a sham vertebroplasty where the physician uh, uh, takes the patient to the 
uh, angel suite that does the local anesthesia, goes all the way to the pedicle, taps a little bit there, they open the cement, so you have the, the smell of the cement and then they actually do not do the procedure. So comparing um, a real procedure with a procedure we don't do is, um, uh, is debatable. Um, so it, it produces a lot of conflicting results because of these methodological uh, differences. And uh, in all cases, the endpoints were pain and disability scores. So um, um, this was uh, Professor Barr who shared the slides with me. Uh, I won't go into detail. This is a resume of all those studies. But basically, there's no, up to now, no definite proof for or against vertebral augmentation, so vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty for pain or disability. But there's a trend to suggest that if you have an early treatment of um, these fractures within the first three months or even better, first six weeks, then you do have a benefit. And uh, one of the issues with these studies was, uh, depending on which one, some were very, very thorough, but there uh, was the inclusion criteria where you had patients that were uh, many months down the line or did not have an MRI to demonstrate that you have an edema, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so the evidence is based on studies that evaluate pain relief and functional scores. And, uh, but aside from these methodological issues, um, the validity of, of a pain-geared study uh, to, to uh, assess the benefits of these procedures, uh, I think, must be questioned. First of all, pain is a difficult uh, uh, um, say, um, parameter to, uh, it is completely subjective, so it's not something that we can objectivize. And then, um, do you have a question, Dr. Green? Yes, uh, the two questions. Um, uh, is, is there a way to differentiate acute uh, for chron or chronic fractures on x-ray? Well, you, you, you can see clefts, for example. Sometimes if they have uh, enough air, um, then you can see a cleft and you can say that it's, uh, uh, I learned that those were already old fractures, but sometimes they can form um, very early. But otherwise, uh, if you see sclerosis, you can uh, sometimes say at least it's not really, really recent. It can maybe have several weeks. Um, the degree of deformity, we have a vertebra plana. Normally, you don't get that in two, three days. It takes several weeks to establish. Um, but I, I think it's difficult to date without those, uh, especially without a former, a previous study. The uh, follow-up question, is there a time frame for vertebroplasty? Is it doable in chronic cases? Yeah, especially if we have clefts. I mean, it, it, if you select your patients well and there's still edema, um, then you can, for me, there's no time limit. I, I would treat patients that were maybe one year down the line. Uh, now, the thing is that they might have other issues associated uh, with the fracture. Some of the pain comes from the fracture, but some of the pain might come uh, from, uh, well, for example, this facet syndromes that are very frequently associated. So it's very important to tell the patient that um, uh, it might not work. Uh, normally it works. It's something that works very well, but in these patients, I, sometimes clinically even, it's difficult to know whether uh, the pain really comes from the fracture. You, there's no real, real pain when you're pressing on the, on the spinous processes. Uh, so it's, uh, there are many confounding factors. So as long as the patient, I mean, you have to have a suspicion that the, some of the pain comes from there, uh, but uh, you have to inform the patient that there are lower uh, there's a lower probability of uh, removing their pain or reducing it significantly. <clears throat> so one of the problem with those uh, studies uh, is that uh, all of the other benefits of treatment, reduction of kyphosis and all those things are not taken into account. And this has an impact. For example, there are, to my knowledge, two, two countries in the world that do not uh, actually reimburse vertebral plasty and uh, kyphoplasty, that's uh, Holland, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, Australia. But I, I heard last week that maybe Australia is coming back uh, towards reimbursement. But these studies have um, done a lot of, um, you might have heard that this New England uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, there were two studies that appeared uh, uh, in 2008, I think. And um, a lot of uh, that, that question actually the utility, but it's not just pain, it's all the other um, benefits. So where does the pain come from? Um, it's 
not always easy. And uh, this is a patient that I had a few weeks back. So 78 year old male, retired gym teacher, used to be very, very sportive, had a prostate carcinoma uh, years ago, apparently uh, no recurrence. And he was referred to, to me by the neurosurgeons uh, for percutaneous treatment of his uh, fracture. Um, so he had a fall in um, December um, 2020. And this is a CT, so clearly there is a fracture here. And it's actually, um, you have a, the, 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 uh, the cortical rim is, is, uh, is fractured. You have a pedicular fracture. You have a little indentation here of the inner cortical uh, lining. Um, so there is clearly a fracture and it's a non-consolidated fracture. So there's edema. Um, but then there's also uh, spondylolisthesis here uh, from a bilateral ismolysis. And then um, there's also a big facet uh, degenerative disease that is actually inflammatory. So you can see some, uh, some uh, fluid in the joints and some uh, very uh, uh, articular uh, edema. And then um, he also has a severe uh, stenosis of his canal with this cyst, actually that probably comes from the, ligam the, the ligamentum flavum that developed since December in his last MRI. Uh, but he has a very severe stenosis as well. So he really has a lot of uh, possible causes for his pain. And when you talk to him, uh, he basically tells you he has a sort of left sacroiliac buttox pain. And when you press on, you examine him, it's a very excruciating localized uh, area. When you tap on his spinous processes, there's no pain, no pain in the morning when he gets up. So for example, one, I find that's a very good sign of a, for a vertebral fracture when you the patient tells you that the worst moment of the day is uh, when they get out of bed. Uh, that's uh, very difficult for them. Um, and he had actually mechanical pain that increased depending on his um, daily activities. And if he didn't do much, he had less pain. If he did more, he had more pain and uh, no pain at night. And anyway, uh, so at the end, um, um, I, I did a, a facet um, block and uh, he called me two days ago to tell me that the pain was gone. And uh, uh, so I mean, it might come back, but at least I think it's not the vertebral fracture. So one has to be careful. It's not because there's a fracture that it's the cause of the pain. And he initially, and that's why talking to really having a good uh, uh, history, in the beginning, he had a lot of pain that was really related to his fracture uh, with all those elements I told you about, but that changed. And now it was localized somewhere else. So uh, beware. Uh, that a fracture is not necessarily painful, even if it's not consolidated. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll I'll try to go more quickly. Um, uh, this is actually a meta-analysis that was done uh, recently uh, to evaluate the the mortality risk. And actually, the the uh, so two million patients that were selected, and uh, um, they underwent vertebral augmentation, and there's 22 percent less. Uh, a, a reduction of, uh, of mortality in uh, up to two year, 10 years in patients that have benefit from a percutaneous treatment. And that benefit is higher for kyphoplasty than vertebroplasty, maybe because there's less um, um, uh, progression of the fracture after or because there's a little bit of, a, of a, um, uh, restoration uh, and reduction of the, of the kyphosis. But in any case, there was significant, and there are other studies that, that clearly have uh, showed this. So um, it's not just uh, pain relief, but there are other issues. Now, why does vertebroplasty and orchiphoplasty, why do, why do they relieve the pain? So there are different options. There's mechanical stabilization of the vertebra by the cement, um, be it a uh, cleft, that's always very painful, or most of the time, or microfractures, micro instability, which can also explain why for example, with the vertebroplasty, um, you can uh, uh, take away a radicular irritative syndrome simply by giving a stability um, uh, on the microarchitecture of the vertebra. Um, the exothermic polymerization of the cement. So these are uh, usually polymethyl metacrylate, and um, traditionally they were very exothermic uh, cements. And then also, um, the um, destruction of the nerve fibers uh, by the solvent, the monomer, which is supposed to be toxic. Now, cements, uh, a lot of, uh, especially um, 
Um, recently, uh, we have cements that are not at all exothermic, so the exothermic effect is not an issue. It's not uh, incriminated in this reduction of pain because uh, those patients do as well as with an exothermic cement. And uh, I used at one point um, a silicone-based cement, which has no monomer and is completely non-toxic because it's silicone. The pain relief was the same. So uh, I really think that it's the mechanical stabilization of the vertebra by the cement. <clears throat> so what is the risk? One of the criticisms, and um, we always very often hear this from rheumatologists, specifically them, is that um, there's this notion that um, doing a augmentation procedure, a percutaneous procedure will increase the risk of a, a fracture, especially of the adjacent uh, level. So um, what is the risk of an adjacent or remote uh, fracture after percutaneous treatment? It's about 15 to 20 percent. And uh, then if you look at the annual risk of a new osteoporotic fracture in patients with acute fractures, obviously if you're five years down the line of fracture, your risk is lower, but immediately after, for the year following the fracture, it's a, also between 15, 20%. So basically this 15, 20% risk is due to the um, natural history of the disease if you don't treat it. But there are some risk factors uh, for developing uh, new fractures after percutaneous treatment. First one, no, that the patient doesn't get any osteoporosis treatment. Low BMI, very dry um, old ladies uh, at high risk. Then cement leaks, and these are really procedure related uh, situations. If you have a, a large leak into the disc space that can uh, induce a compression fracture of the adjacent vertebra. And then also the non-correction of the kyphotic uh, deformity. So it's not always possible to correct it if it's really a very, very, very sclerotic um, vertebra, uh, especially if it's not the one you're treating, uh, but the, this is uh, generally the, the cause of that. So the, the priority of these patients after we remove the pain, because that's number one priority, is um, to get that treatment going on uh, for the osteoporosis. And at the moment, I have to say, uh, I've treated some patients that hardly have any pain, but because they have a deformity, uh, we've identified that as a good indication to the treatment. Um, so th this is uh, a lady several years back, and uh, she came in in uh, October 2014 with pain. Uh, they didn't refer her, she had conservative treatment, and then in January, uh, she had this new fracture here of um, uh, D12. And then, um, so I did vertebroplasty on these two lesions, and uh, Two days after, when she was supposed to go home, um, she had a lot of pain, but she was a very com complicated person, um, uh, very difficult to really evaluate her pain. Anyway, the neurosurgeons, because they, she was at their hospitalized um, in their ward, uh, we, we decided to let her go um, home. And um, she came back, um, uh, um, I mean, we did an MRI before, and then this retrospectively was uh, probably a, a fracture, which actually is confirmed on the, an MRI done two weeks later, uh, where she has this, uh, re this time this real clearly clear cut fracture. So a uh, new vertebroplasty, and then um, the story goes on like this with new fractures all the time. And um, at the end, sorry, this is uh, um, three months later, she ended up with all these uh, uh, vertebroplasties. So, uh, and this patient did not have any anti uh, osteoporotic uh, treatment. So it's, these are patients that come in, uh, I see a few of them every year, um, with uh, really severe fragility and they, they, they fracture uh, you treat them three, four times in uh, two, three months. <coughs> so we, among the implantable devices that really have changed the management of these patients, uh, we have virtual body stenting and um, this is a patient um, uh, who has quite a bit of a um, uh, kyphotic deformity at the T12 L1 junction. So this is somebody we would like to, to actually uh, reduce uh, their, their kyphotic deformity and she was in a lot of pain. So we put the stents. Um, for those who do these things, um, this was at the beginning when I, uh, it's really much better if you can manage to do a very horizontal uh, approach. And then uh, we, we did manage to, to lift up uh, that vertebra, uh, very good with pain relief. And then uh, this is uh, the follow-up on, uh, on stand upright x-ray. And you see that there's a significant reduction of the kyphotic deformation. 
<clears throat> so this is um, uh, what has really completely changed, uh, not just for psychotic patients, but um, for um, uh, oncological patients. So in two weeks time, when you're there, I will show you the applications for the oncological spine. So this is a stent screw assisted internal fixation, which was developed by Alessandro Tacconi, who's in Lugano. And um, so what <coughs> the idea is to put some stents in the vertebral body. So initially it was used mostly for a severely, uh, osteo severe osteolytic uh, metastasis, um, but then it was applied to, to osteoporosis as well. And the idea is to put a stent and then put a fenestrated, cannulated uh, screw through the pedicle through which you're going to be able to inject the cement and you have this 360 internal stabilization. And um, biomechanically, it made much more sense to stabilize from the inside than having screws uh, and, uh, and, um, and rods to try to prevent the, the spine from bending over. Um, so <clears throat> one of the <clears throat> issues with these fractures or actually sometimes after treatment is this middle column, uh, which is at risk because also with vertebroplasty, but also with stents, um, you're going to be filling the, the uh, two anterior thirds of the vertebral body, but then you still have uh, this uh, middle column that, that is left unprotected. And uh, sometimes you can see this sort of a situation where you have um, uh, a middle column uh, dislocation, disruption uh, due to the forces that are being applied in this non-protected um, uh, middle column. So recently, just two months ago, he, he, his group uh, published this, uh, this paper, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, they called it the armed concrete approach. And uh, it's this uh, safe um, technique, the stent screw assisted internal fixation. And it's actually a reconstruction uh, for, for these uh, very severe vertebral fractures. So it's a retrospective uh, study, uh, but of a prospectively maintained database. And they included 73 patients with 80 uh, trochilumbar uh, treated levels. And um, follow up was up to six months in 91% of the patients. And these were really severe fractures with a lot of, uh, um, you know, virtual collapse, uh, fragmentation. Uh, a lot of them were, most of them were burst fractures, corporal pedicular fracture um, associated 70%. So these are fractures that are um, not the banal A1, just compression fractures. So uh, these are not good candidates sometimes for just vertebral plasty. And surgery is not a good alternative either because of the osteoporosis and the fragility of these patients. So they had the, the, the usual significant reduction of uh, the pain scores and the, uh, the patient's um, positive uh, subjective global clinical impact. And uh, they had 14 new uh, fractures in 11 patients, somewhere adjacent, somewhere remote. And uh, in all cases, the target level stability was maintained. So that, that means that there was no uh, the fixation uh, state over time, and there were no um, associated uh, screw uh, dislocations or migrations or things like that. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the safe technique. So this is a patient I, um, I treated uh, actually two days ago. She came in in, uh, in February with this uh, fracture after a fall from height, so not, not a, a big accident. Um, so. This is a nosoprotic fracture, and you can see that on like two weeks later, she has this uh, nearly this virtual plana that has appeared, a lot of pain, um, and uh, you see there's a kyphotic deformity, and this is, I don't know if it's the right term in English, but the impingement of this uh, angle, um, anterior inferior angle of the adjacent vertebra is actually resting inside the other vertebra through the disc. A lot of pain with this cleft, and this was actually two week old fracture, so you can see that. These clefts can, can, can appear very, very early. Um, and this is actually a burst fracture with this retropulsion of the posterior wall, uh, fracture by particular fracture here. So, this is a, a vertebra that needs to be stabilized, uh, or else it's good to uh, continue maybe um, progressing into the um, spinal canal. Excuse me, I'm just going to close the window. And um, so this needs uh, stabilization. Uh, we always do the MR, um, make sure there's not, not another vertebra that we need to deal with is our uh, modic one changes. 
and um, uh, sorry, the order of the images are wrong, but uh, this is just to show you what we do. So first you get an access to put your stent, like for normal stenting. And then uh, just by raising this, the stents, you can see that you, you lift this vertebra uh, quite a bit. Then you very often have a recoil of the stent, so you lose a little bit of height. <clears throat> and then you're gonna put your screws in. Uh, the other, so here we do, there was, I think, a clear indication to treat the upper adjacent uh, vertebra and because of the impingement. And I, I don't usually do it, but I also treated the lower one. And uh, actually this was a nice case where we have an agenesis. There's no uh, pedicle on the left side. So we did a unilateral approach, but we were obliged to do that. Then we put the cement and this is what it looks like uh, with the screws through the pedicle. And you have this uh, cement really um, um, uh, joining the, the stents anteriorly. And uh, this is a 360 stabilization. Now, <clears throat> this is the, um, the first, the second x-ray where you see the uh, the fracture, this is on the ventral position, uh, the final control of the treatment. And today we did the upright um, uh, imaging and you can see that we, there's always a bit of loss of height, uh, but the, the vertebra is actually, all the, the, the vertebral end plates are parallel. And uh, we see that there's this impingement has disappeared. And often what we can observe is that uh, we have a, the disc space is actually going to increase after uh, stent, uh, stenting of the vertebra because we're pushing upwards the disc uh, through the end plate. Um, so this can also probably favor healing of the disc and, uh, and uh, limit the risk of a degenerative disc disease. Um, so we have a height gain, if we compare, they're pretty much at the same height. And uh, we have a kyphotic angle um, a reduction. So the kyphosis here was not very important yet, but we probably if we hadn't treated, she would have fractured this one, and then that would be a cascade uh, leading to kyphosis. And then uh, this impingement has disappeared. So I think this is a vertebra that uh, should uh, evolve nicely. Uh, the only pain she had today was uh, uh, at the puncture points, but other than that, she, she did not uh, report the, the, the previous pain. Importantly, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, when you do these treatments, you need to, to know what's going to happen after, and uh, most of the patients are going to be better. And there are three main scenarios where pain, uh, the, the, the patient has uh, pain after the procedure. Well, you might have treated the wrong vertebra, uh, so you will limit this risk by doing an MR, or actually the, the fractured vertebra was, was not uh, the, the one that was responsible for the, for the pain. Um, and if there's a pain-free interval, uh, or even 12 hours, I've seen that. But the patient, you go see them after the procedure, the, they, they were walking around and they were very happy because there was a significant reduction of pain. And the next morning you go to see them and they're, they're crying out again. Uh, so you have to rule out a new fracture, whether it's 12 hours after or two weeks later. But once the pain has disappeared, it should not come back. Um, and uh, the residual pain can be due to facet or sacroiliac joint syndrome. So we're, I would say maybe 20 to, yeah, 20% 20 of the patients that come in um, end up having uh, some facet uh, block. Um, immediately, if they have really a lot of significant pain or uh, if physiotherapy doesn't, doesn't work, then we do that. And normally, uh, on light degenerative uh, facet joint uh, uh, syndromes, they respond very well, and it's very rare we need to infiltrate them again. So the take-home message, um, as we've seen, it's very frequent osteoporosis, and uh, um, uh, it's under-treated. And um, uh, even after osteoporotic fractures, which would be a big red flag to introduce this treatment. So it's very important for us uh, radiologists to um, uh, sensitize the, the prescribing physicians uh, to, to this uh, problem. And uh, I think um, we, we can always suggest in our report uh, that this patient needs an osteoporosis workup and that this translates to osteoporosis and it needs to be treated. Um, so it's, uh, these fractures are an important cause of morbidity and even uh, mortality. Um, so that uh, adds a, a probably a, a 
uh, another indication to treat them. And uh, this is the role I was mentioning where we, uh, I think we need to be active to, to help the physicians, uh, uh, the GPs uh, to, to, to deal with this. And um, probably in the following um, years, uh, I think studies will demonstrate that uh, the, it's not just uh, pain palliation. Uh, we're trying to reduce other complications due to the fractures, which we've mentioned. So there will probably be a shift of paradigm and um, uh, uh, through the evolving uh, technologies and new devices, I think we'll be able to treat more and more of these patients. So um, I'm, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to, to take them. This is uh, Sion. Um, this is a picture from right next to my house. The hospital is actually around here, uh, just in the back. And that's where I am right now. And uh, we have uh, two castles, one a medieval one right here. And this is an old abbey, which um, has the oldest working um, organ in the world. So it's from 1460 something. Uh, so if you come to Sion, I would be very happy to uh, to show you all this. Pakistan, Milan, uh, it's a beautiful country. Uh, a question from uh, Enrique here. Are there problems of rejection in post-operative patients? Uh, sorry, of? Are there problems of rejection in post-operative patients? Re re rejection of the implants? Yes. <clears throat> no, I would say. I mean, there's very, very little, little literature on allergic reactions to PMMA. The PMMA has been used by orthopedics and dentists for many decades now. Uh, so it's, um, uh, to my knowledge, it's not a clinical issue. Uh, there are no more questions. Uh, there is an excellent presentation comment. Uh, congratulations from uh, Dr. Ernesto uh, Dina Jr. in uh, Mexico. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for uh, the presentation. It's nice to get everyone around the world together uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. So um, just wanted to kind of thank all the audience uh, from around the world. And uh, thank you, Dr. San Milan. Um, those are some great uh, images of your country. And uh, well, I hope to visit there one day. You'll be welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. And hello, Dr. Dillon. I see that you're... Diego, uh, it's nice to see you in person. It was a wonderful lecture, and uh, it's a, a pleasure to have you in uh, the Health for the World. So thank you so much. That was a great, great lecture, and we uh, we hope that we can bring some of those tools to our patients. I know I don't do personally vertebroplasties or kyphoplasties, but several of my colleagues do, and I'm sure they would be very interested in uh, in the screw fixation. That sounds very interesting. So I hope all, all is well there, and you're staying safe, and uh, you know, Maybe the vaccine will be coming soon to you. Hopefully, you know, maybe you've already had it. But uh, let's let's pray. Very, very delayed in Switzerland. Much much much. Um, um, no one no no one's been vaccinated yet uh, among us. Uh, okay. Or anything. So it will come. Yeah, it will be. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. Soon. All right. Nice to see you, Diego. Thank you, and thanks to everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody.